Hi, welcome back to another episode of Curator on the Loose. I am Matthew Burchett and I'm the Senior Curator at the Museum of Flight in Seattle. And today we're doing another segment of Dueling Duos. This time, Spitfire versus BF-109. BF-109 versus the Spitfire, the classic dueling duo that everybody loves. These two guys went head to head on May 13, 1940, but it wasn't until the Battle of Britain in September of 1940 where they really duped it out. When France fell in 1940 in June, Hitler turned his eyes toward Britain and he knew that he wanted to invade that country. But before he did that, he decided, you know what, I'm gonna see if they'll capitulate first. Well, of course, the Brits said, no way, which left Hitler in kind of a hard spot. How do you get to Britain? They're surrounded by water, they're an island, which means an amphibious assault. That's not easy. So he put together an idea called Operation Sea Lion, an amphibious assault of Britain. One of the four directives was to take out the RAF, and the Luftwaffe decided, we got this, and off they went. So when you think about it, the Battle of Britain is really nothing more than extension of one of the four of Hitler's directives before they invaded Great Britain. Unfortunately for the Germans, the Brits weren't going down without a fight. Let's start here. The BF-109. This guy was first fielded in 1937 during the Spanish Civil War. And the Germans sent a bunch of Luftwaffe pilots to Spain. They called them the Condor Legion. And what they did is they got a ton of combat experience that helped them later on. This plane was designed by Willie Messerschmitt and Robert Lusser. And it was an incredible fighter at the time. In fact, until the rise of the Spitfire, it was the plane to beat. In fact, it was hard to beat. The 109 was designed as an interceptor, but it flew until the end of the war in many different variations as a fighter bomber, as a night fighter, reconnaissance aircraft, all sorts of things. It was a versatile airframe. Now ours is an E-3 which was the version that was used mostly during the Battle of Britain. It's what everybody kind of thinks of as the Battle of Britain bird. The E-3 model came to the front lines in 1935, and one of the big improvements over the earlier E's and the D's was the engine. It carried a DB-601AA engine, which gave it a top speed of about 348 miles per hour. That's pretty fast for back then, and it made this plane a speedy little fighter. But guess what? It also had a huge punch. The armament of the E3 is what put it a couple of steps ahead of its competition. And one of those was right there in the hole of the spinner. That was an MGFF 20 millimeter cannon. Now don't get excited. It sounds cool, but in reality, it didn't work that well. In fact, a lot of them were removed from the aircraft because they jammed. With the removal of the MGFF in the nose, the pilot relied on two more MGFFs in the wings. The problem was, is they only had 60 rounds of 20 millimeter a piece. That equaled out to about seven seconds worth of fire time. That's not a lot. The good thing was, is that 20 millimeter fired an explosive shell, which could be devastating. If it didn't bring down a Spitfire, it certainly damaged it to the point where if it was able to get back to base, a lot of times they couldn't even use it anymore. On top of that, right up on the cowling were two 7.92 millimeter machine guns. Now those guys had a thousand rounds apiece, so that's what the pilot turned to the most. Unfortunately, they're considered a rifle caliber machine gun, which means they're pretty small. We're not talking the 50 caliber machine guns on American fighters, 
No, no, this is closer to about a 30 caliber, and it had a lot of problems punching through armor plate, and that could be a problem. But coupled with the 20, this guy had a punch. One of the things that the Germans had to improve on the 109 was pilot armor. There was very little at the beginning of the war. So the Germans added about 81 and a half pounds to the E3 model to improve pilot safety and survivability. Most of that was behind the pilot's back, right behind the seat. But there was a large headpiece that curved over the top of the head, which was attached to the canopy, which is great Unfortunately, it cut the visibility down quite a bit, and the visibility to begin with wasn't even that great. One of the biggest problems of the 109 was its range. It had a very small fuel tank, and it only could go about 410 miles. That's a real problem, especially during the Battle of Britain. By the time the fighters got to where they needed to be, they only had about 10 minutes to support the bombers before they had to return home. That's a huge problem when the Spitfires were right over their home bases. Now there are a couple of oddities about the 109. First and foremost was it used an inverted V12 engine. Now the engine itself wasn't that odd. The P-51 used a V12, but in the case of the 109, it was inverted, which means that it was turned upside down. So the cylinders were pointing downwards instead of upwards. That actually gave the pilot better visibility and it improved the thrust line of the aircraft, which led to an increase in stability in some cases. Another oddity was the landing gear. It was very close together. The track of the wheels was very close together. It meant that it was very hard to land this plane and a lot of pilots would end up ground looping because the wheels were so close together. But one of the cool things about it, still odd for the day, was the automatic slats. Another oddity of the 109, which actually turned out to be pretty awesome, were these guys, and you can see that red line right there. Those were automatic slats, and they weren't deployed electrically or by the pilot. They would just come out and retract on their own depending upon what was going on. Now, an automatic slat actually improves low speed performance and high angle of attack, and it meant that the 109 had a pretty tight turn radius. You don't see them a lot on World War II planes. In fact, they didn't become really a, a major feature until the F-86. Now let's talk about the iconic Spitfire. It was designed by Reginald Mitchell, and it came to the front lines in 1938. But for a time, there was a possibility that there would never even be a Spitfire. It took forever to ramp up production from Supermarine, but it finally got on track, and here we have it. And it was an amazing plane. It was designed as a fighter interceptor. And eventually, there were 24 different models and 52 submodels. That's amazing. It's one of the very few planes, if not the only plane, that flew from the very first day of the war all the way to the end of the war. There are not a lot of planes that can say that. So as everybody knows, there are a couple of things that make the Spitfire the Spitfire, and one of them is the engine. They carried a Merlin. In the case of the Mark I, they carried a Merlin III, which had just over a thousand horsepower that gave this guy a little over 362 miles per hour. Now, once you started adding armor and all that kind of thing that the Brits learned that they needed to do to make the Spit really combat ready, it dropped the speed quite a bit. In fact, the ME-109 and the Spitfire were pretty close in speed by the time the Battle of Britain rolled around. On the Mark I Spitfire, it was equipped with eight 303 caliber machine guns. Now that sounds impressive, but like the 109, the 303 was considered a rifle caliber cartridge, which means it was small. Think 30 caliber abouts. 
which means that it had a hard time punching through armor unless you were using either an armor piercing round or an incendiary round. And the British had a great incendiary round that could do quite a bit of damage to German aircraft if it hit them in the gas tank. Now, one of the problems of having those eight machine guns was that early on they would freeze up and that became a real problem. If you're in combat and you can't shoot, you're not doing yourself or your buddies any good. The British had modified their 303s to fire from an open bolt, which means that when they were flying along, the bolt of the machine gun was literally open, which allowed air to go right down the barrel and into the receiver of the machine gun, and it froze up. But the Brits got smart. That's where this little red tape comes in. They would just dope a patch of tape right over the gun barrel ports and that would keep out dirt and moisture and all sorts of stuff until you were ready to fire your guns. And by that time, your guns had heated up. In fact, they even had a system to pump hot air into the gun bays. That's pretty smart when you think about it. So one of the advantages of the Spitfire's armament was that it carried 2,400 rounds for its machine guns. That's an improvement over the 109. In fact, that's about 160 rounds per second when all eight guns are firing. That's a pretty big punch. Just like the 109, the Spitfire carried armor plate. In this case, about 73 pounds of armor. Most of it was behind the pilot because you want to keep that guy safe. He also had an armored headrest, but he even had a big plate of armor in front of the glycol tank because since the V-12 Merlin was water-cooled, you don't want to lose your antifreeze in a gunfight. The Spitfire was at a disadvantage in its range. It only had about 248 miles of range because it had a small 85-gallon fuel tank. Now, the good thing is, is it could carry a drop tank. In fact, later models carried a slipper tank or even wing tanks. But the biggest advantage was the fact that they were fighting right above their airfields. They didn't have to go far to attack the Germans. That was a huge advantage over the 109, which couldn't carry a drop tank at all until the later E7 model. And so with that 10 minutes of fight time, the Germans were at a severe disadvantage. Like the 109, the Spitfire had its own oddities. And like the 109, as you can see, it had a narrow track landing gear, which made it kind of difficult to land. But a bigger problem was its carburetor. It just had a float type carburetor. Now for comparison, the 109 was fuel injected, which means that during high speed maneuvers, like a nose over or a dive, the engine for the 109 wouldn't quit, whereas with the float type carburetor that the Spitfire had, if they nosed over, their engine quit. That's a problem. Now, of course, it would come back on, but it meant for just a couple of seconds they lost power. That's not a good thing when you're in the middle of a dogfight and you got Hans Ossi Hahn right on your tail, who, by the way, was a German fighter ace. One of the oddities of the Spitfire that was actually really great was the fact that it carried IFF, otherwise known as identification friend or foe. That means that the British radar system could identify each and every Spitfire as a good guy and not a German aircraft. That was a huge advantage to the Brits during the Battle of Britain. So let's talk about our two aircraft, not these guys in general. Like I alluded to earlier, ours is not a Mark I, it's a Spitfire Mark IX. What makes a Spitfire IX a Spitfire IX? Well, in 1942, when the FW-190 Falkwolf came around, the new to the British Spit Mark V was completely outclassed by the FW-190, and the Brits knew they had a problem. So they started taking Mark V's and they dropped in a Merlin 61 engine, which gave this plane a huge punch. 
and they added those two 20 millimeter cannons as well as machine guns, which gave it a really good kick. And that finally brought the Brits right on par, if not above what the Germans were fielding at the time. And it was a huge relief to them. Now, this particular plane was built in 1944 at Castle Bromwich, and it actually flew over the D-Day beaches in June. That is really cool. Then it flew for the Dutch and it flew for the Belgians. After the war, it was bought by Cliff Robertson. And you probably saw it in the movie, The Longest Day. How cool is that? Now, what about our ME-109? Well, it's not really an ME-109. It's a Spanish Hispano HA-1112. And I know you've seen them before, because if you're watching this show, more than likely, you've watched the 1960s movie, Battle of Britain, and you've seen the 109s and gone, it looks like a 109, but it looks funky. That's because the HA-1112 used a completely different engine than the DB-601. Now, Doug Champlin bought this particular aircraft and he knew he wanted to bring it back as close to an E model as he could, so he searched long and hard for a DB-601 engine and its cowling. Unfortunately, those are not easy to find, so he settled on a 605, a DB-605, and it looks, from the exterior, very, very similar, if not almost identical, to an E model. Now, if you've tuned into this show, I'm pretty sure you've also watched the movie Patton and, like I said, the Battle of Britain. Well, guess what? This plane has been in both of those movies. So what does it come down to? Basically, both planes are really well matched, but there are a couple of advantages for both. For example, the 109 harder hitting armament with those 20 millimeter cannons. It also could dive much faster than a Spitfire. However, the Spitfire was better at lower altitudes. It was faster down there. And most of the combat during Battle of Britain occurred under 20,000 feet. The British also had this going for them. They had a better view out of the cockpit. And as any fighter pilot knows, your head needs to be on a swivel. And if you can't see out the back, that's a huge disadvantage. Now, neither plane had a great view, but we gotta give it to the Spitfire there. They definitely had a better view than the 109 pilot. Now, the British also had a huge non-aircraft related advantage, and that was radar. They had home chain system, which allowed them to see the German planes right after they took off practically, and it allowed them a lot of time to be able to scramble and be in the air by the time the Germans got there, which turned out to be a disadvantage for the Germans because by the time they got to Britain, they only had 10 minutes of fight time, whereas the British were right over their own bases. Huge advantage for them. So I'm gonna call this a pretty even match. What it really came down to was tactical. Who got in the air first? Who had the height advantage? And what pilot was fighting what pilot? There were great pilots on either side. And as we all know, no matter what the plane is, it depends on who's flying it that makes the huge difference. Okay, there you go. Dueling Duos Battle of Britain edition. We probably didn't answer it in the way you wanted, but you know what? Nobody is ever going to answer the Battle of Britain Spitfire versus 109 to everybody's happiness. It's just the way it goes. But we want to say thank you for tuning into this episode. It was a whole lot of fun to do. I love both of these planes, and it's so much fun to be able to do this. If you've got questions or comments, again, hit us up on Facebook, YouTube, or even send us an email at curator at museumofflight.org. Tune in next week because we're going back to 1917.